Sorry, we were just finishing a few logistics somewhere here. Uh, Council, are we ready to continue this afternoon? If we are, please proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, and members of the audience. We are ready to proceed with the next witness. Thank you, Mr. Usher. Um, there's no need to swear the witness. He was already sworn last week. Or perhaps may I ask the guidance of the chairman if he needs to be resworn. It's been one week since he testified. Should we simply remind him of his oath or, res uh, or have him sworn again? Counsel, if we continue with the witness who appeared them before, no need them to go through that. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Thank you. Dr. Daffe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome back to the TRRC. Um, thank you for coming back to complete your testimony, which was disrupted as a result of technical difficulties we experienced um, the last time during that big storm. As you already know, my name is um, Sagar. I will be the legal counsel guiding your testimony today. Um, we have already gone through the rules and regulations here at the TRRC, but just for emphasis, I'll repeat uh, some of them in case you've forgotten. Um, I would just advise you to assume a very comfortable sitting position and just to draw the microphone close to you so that you don't have to strain and bend as you give your testimony. And also to facilitate interpretation um, of your testimony into the different uh, local languages. Please um, speak slowly and also listen to my questions carefully. And um, just to avoid overlap in our speeches, allow me to um, say my questions first or allow me to ask my questions first before you respond and I will do the same. Thank you. Um, at any point as well, if you would like me to repeat my question um, or you would like me to clarify any points, please um, do so. We've already gone through some of the topics um, that you were supposed to testify on on the last date. Um, you are testifying as an expert on um, sexual gender-based violence, otherwise known as SGBV, and for the purposes of your testimony, I will refer to sexual gender-based violence as SGBV. We've gone through your educational and professional background and training. Um, you have given us the definition of SGBV and the different types, um, as well as some of the more severe types of SGBV, such as gang rape and um, FGM, and some of the complications arising um, from them, such as fistula. Um, you were just explaining how the one-stop center works, which you um, do in collaboration with the network um, against gender-based violence um, when you were interrupted by our technical difficulties. Just so that we can understand uh, more clear clearly, I will just ask you um, perhaps just to give us um, what the definition of uh, fistula is before we, we move on, please. Fistula, for a layman to understand, is an opening between the bladder and the vagina, and also between the uh, vagina and the rectum. It may occur as a result of um, a difficult labor or obstructed labor. It may also occur as a result of a, a long-term complication of FGM, which may lead to obstructed labor, or uh, gang rape, as I mentioned last time, that raped a victim at the same time you introduce an object into the vagina, causing injury to the bladder. Thereby, a woman will be leaking urine continuously without control. Um, you said that um, it's an opening between the rectum and the vagina, um, and you've already said also that. Um, some of the causes or symptoms would be leakage of urine through the vagina. Apart from leakage of urine, would there be any other um, excreta that is um, excreted from the vagina? Yes, uh, feces, of course. If there is a hole between the vagina and the rectum, there will be feces mm -hmm. leaking through the vagina. Thank you very much. Um, we will then proceed to, your, um, to the point at which your testimony was interrupted. interrupted. You were explaining about the one-stop center, and you had explained about all the different steps and the different procedure. You talked about the legal 
um, perspective as well as the so psychosocial um, aspect of the one-stop center. And um, you were explaining about the medical aspect when, when um, your testimony basically was disrupted. Can you just continue from there and tell us what the medical aspect of the one-stop center is, please? Yes, uh, one-stop center is about uh, um, three services under one unit. That is the service of the medical personnel, that are the nurses and the doctors, and also the service of the social worker, and then the service of the legal um, uh, experts, that is the lawyers or the counsel, I will call it. For medical doctors and the nurses is to give medical services. In the sense, you take the history when you receive these GBV cases at your facility, take history, examine the victim, um, send for any investigations, like if they are more than 12 years, you send them for pregnancy test. If there is, your history is pointing toward rape or defilement or whatever form of the GBV, then you send them for uh, pregnancy test, scanning sometimes if necessary, and then also certain tests like HIV, and then also hepatitis test. The reason for doing this test is we want to confirm first, prior to this incident, whether the victims is pregnant or had an infection or, yes, and that will lead, tell us, so that we separate the two. So, because at the end of the day, you have to write a medical report after giving the medication, after examining the patient, you have to give medication to these victims. And then also the report has to be written, and this report has to go to the police station. They sometimes have to file it to the court, so that you separate the two, the prior incident and the incident of the rape itself. What are come after that? Usually we give them three months interval. If everything is negative, is normal, we call it because if you look at a window period for HIV and uh, maybe three months. So we allow them to come three months after to check them again. If they happen to get positive, whether it's pregnancy or whether it's hepatitis or whether it is HIV, then we will relate to the, the rape or the domestic violence or the sexual violence that occur. Dr. Dr. Dafer, just please um, draw the microphone closer to you and um, just pull it down a little bit. Thank you. So that we can hear you properly. Thank you. Um, I think you've just given us the steps that you would normally follow as a medical profession in the case of uh, rape. Is that correct? Yes, counsel. Yes. Um, do you receive any other kinds of sexual uh, violence cases at the hospital apart from rape? Yes, apart from rape, uh, defilement, uh, domestic violence like wife battering, especially pregnant women, we have seen a lot, uh, FGM is another form of a violence that we have seen, which uh, in my experience led to the death of a child that I experienced, unfortunately. Uh, kidnapping and then the... Let's just go back to FGM. You were explaining about uh, the example of the death of a child. Just tell us more about that before you, you move on. Yes, I think it's 2015. Uh, this is a child that was uh, less than one year, was uh, reported with the family members. Apparently, they said the child underwent circumcision. I was on duty on that day. And when I saw the child, I examined. Uh, but uh, that time, the child was motionless, and then the, all the vitals were annealed. The peripheries were cold. So, and it was paper white. Paper white, what I mean is you look at the conjunctiva of the child means he has lost blood significantly. Dr. Daffy, um, uh, one of the warnings I, fo I, I actually forgot to remind you about was the fact that some of the medical terms that you're using are not very familiar to us. So please, um, when you use such terms, can you just explain them in layman's um, words? Um, you just explained one, um, which I cannot even repeat right now, um, in the eye. So just explain that to us. There was conjunctiva. That is, you That's open right. the eyes and see, and then if the patient or the victim is pale, 
then you too will tell you. That's a clinical findings. But notwithstanding, you can also go to the lab and check the hemoglobin. Is the hemoglobin per se level to see? And what is hemoglobin? Well, th that is the blood level, not the pressure. Is that a component? And how old was this child? Uh, it's less than one year. And um, can you tell us um, whether there are different types of FGM and what those different types are? Yes, there are different types. They went. They are up to type four. The first type is the the, the cutting of the pupils with or without the cutting clitoris. That is type one. The type two is the cutting of the clitoris with with or without, and then the labia mi mi minor, that is the tissues in the vagina. Those of the medical uh, will understand. And also uh, the third uh, type is the infibulation. Infibulation in the sense the cutting of the clitoris together with the labia majora, and then the remnants are stitched together, leaving the hole up and down up means you leave an opening for the urine to pass and then down for the menstrual blood to pass. So in between them there will be a membrane. And then the fourth type is unclassified type. That is any procedure on the female genitalia that does not um, uh, have any medical significance or purpose then will be considered generally as the type 4 uh, give, uh, FGM. And what was the type that this um, little girl um, was subjected to? Well, this girl clitoris was cut completely. You can even see it. So she, she must have bled from the artery uh, from that region and they could not control the bleeding because it took long time. And then the, by the time they arrived at the hospital, the child said, do you know what is the most common form of FGM that is normally performed um, on women or girls in the Gambia? Gambia, it's, we, it's a general notion that we don't have mutilation, we cutting. But in my clinical practice will tell me, has told me that, uh, well, my clinical experience, I've seen women who are completely sealed. You can even see the labia minor together with the clitoris is cut creating a scar, and sometimes there is only a little hole. Uh, I've did so many procedures for women during Ramadan. Your Ramadan is the month that women normally get married. You have the highest percentage of marriage usually in the month of Ramadan or prior to Ramadan. Your people wanted to, especially those who are not married to. But you can realize <clears throat> that uh, women will get, uh, the girls will get married, go to their husband, they cannot penetrate them. So they eventually they have to come back to the hospital. Some will eventually go back to the traditional way of removing, but that's very dangerous. So they will usually come to the hospital, and then, then we will take to the theater. You have to put them on the general anesthesia again, because it's painful. And then you have to either use forceful dilatation, or you have to use a, an a instrument to open to make sure that the woman uh, continue with the uh, sexual relations with the husband. So, be, so basically, the woman would have to go through a procedure where um, the vagina would then have to be cut. Basically, it would be like going through the process of circumcision again. Yes, I did that on many occasions because the circumcision was so bad that the woman, uh, the man can never penetrate. In s certain scenarios, I've seen also the woman got preg pregnant because the hole was small. There is a sexual contact. A mere contamination of the hand can make a, a woman pregnant. I always tell people this. So the, on two, three occasions, I've seen they got pregnant. And uh, what we did was during labor. You are in labor, but the baby cannot come out. If you are lucky to find yourself in a setting where there are doctors who can operate, can do the procedure and open. Either you open during the, when the woman is fully dilated, that is during the labor, or you can take to the theater, operate, remove the baby, and open the woman again. So it will be a double procedure. You do the cesarean section, at the same time also you open the vagina. So that afterwards can continue with her sexual life. 
And would you say that um, this infibulation procedure would be one of the most severe um, forms of uh, female circumcision or FGM? Certainly. And what are some of the complications that arise as a result of FGM? You have already explained that death can occur. I mean, this little girl came to you and um, she was pronounced dead. Can you tell us what other complications um, that can occur? You also mentioned um, um, fistula. Perhaps you can explain more in detail or give us other forms of complications. The complication of FGM and then the rape in general will be will have um, immediate and long-term complications. The immediate complication will be first, as I mentioned, there will be physical injury, there will be pain, there will be bleeding, and that bleeding, if not controlled, you go into hypovolemic shock and sometimes can lead to death if you don't arrive at the hospital on time. However, we can have um, uh, other complications like uh, uh, urinary retention when it comes to FGM, that the female genital mutilation or cutting. Uh, urinary retention can be one of the complications immediate. We can also have infection, can be also one of the, because most of the time these are not done under sterile procedures. They can use any materials, and then through that you can catch infections. For FGM, those could be the uh, long, uh, short, immediate complications, but the long term are many. The keloid, the scar, the cyst on the vulva can be a complication. Keloid, I mean scar. You know, it's a medical term we use. Cyst means is the swelling in the vulva containing an, uh, a pus. Pus is data in a local or your field in Mandinka. And then also they can have what we call uh, sexual dysfunctions. This is one that they can have a. Uh, what we call uh, uh, pelvic pain and then all sorts of things. Thank you very much, um, Doctor. Um, from what you have said, um, FGM or um, female genital mutilation, um, otherwise known as female genital mutilation or um, female circumcision, is a very serious um, uh, you know, form of sexual violence and it can cause some serious health complications, including death. Yes, Council. Okay, can we um, just move on to perhaps other forms of um, sexual violence that you have experienced um, um, working on, on such cases? Yes, apart from rape, um, FGM, you have defilement, and also uh, wife battery, or assault or physical violence against women, especially pregnant women, is so common. I've received a few cases, and sometimes also during my antenatal service, that is the clinic for the pregnant woman, which I run every Thursday. Sometimes with the conversation with women, you can detect the violence happening in the house. And on many occasions, I did about three, four times, we called the some of the victims who are involved and call their partners to come to the hospital and we advise to help women carry the pregnancy because the pregnancy belongs to all of them. And um, can you give us, ex you've mentioned um, rape cases um, and um, in your view how prevalent is, is rape uh, in the Gambia? I may not be able to give the statistics of the whole country, but my hospital, which I'm in charge of the one-stop center from 2014 to present, I have um, uh, received uh, 46 cases in 2014. That include both domestics and sexual violence. But if you look at the rape form, the majority. Rape is almost, always more than the 50% of what you registered yearly. Or rape will comprise also the attempted rape. Sometimes it's not only but attempted one. So we book them under the same category. So, uh, my apologies. Please continue. Yes. Uh, in 2014, 46 cases. In 2015, we registered 70 cases comprising all the forms of violence. But rape again forms the majority. And then in 2016, it went up to 94. That's my hospital. And the same 
rape form the majority and the people affected or the girls affected or female affected are mostly between the age of five or sometimes even less to 12 years and also between uh, 13 to 30 years usually you that's where you have a bulk of your people uh, who are victims affected so not only is rape the most prevalent form of um, sexual violence, but it's actually on the increase according to your statistics. Yes. Um, do you have any, um, do you have these statistics with you that you mentioned? Yes, I have the statistics with me. Do you have a copy of it? Yes. Can, can we take a look at it? proceed just a minute I just need to refer to the statistics thank you thank you mr. Ture. Okay. this is the statistics NGDV data Carnifing General Hospital these are the statistics that you were referring to just now in your testimony yes and you already mentioned the fact that um, it has been disaggregate, disaggregated according to um, age of, of victims, uh, the gender, as well as the different types of um, sexual violence. Is that correct? Yes, Council. Um, Mr. Chairman, we would like to um, put these statistics of the Carnifing General Hospital um, from 2015 to two, 2019 into evidence. Um, I will give you the exhibit number later on. Thank you. We may proceed, um, Dr. Daffe. Can you give us um, can you give us an example of um, cases of rape um, that you have actually experienced? Perhaps the more um, serious ones, like rape of children, for example, have you encountered any in your professional experience? Yes. Uh it, there are a lot, but uh, the most recent, and that case already ended up. The perpetrator was um, in prison for 15 years. And that came in 2019. It's a case that happened in 2014. Unfortunately, the case was finally decided in 2019. You can see the gap, and that is so some defect in our judicial system, as far as I'm concerned. I stand to be corrected. Uh, this is a child of 11 year old in Busubi. According to the family and from my report, has a, a mental issue, but this mental issue usually come is periodic, not always. And then to, when to, it come as a fly up, usually will disappear from home. And then she happens to disappear from home and then met this man who invited her to the house and then uh, stay with her there for about two, three days, according to her and the family. And then according to her narration that the man Tamba forcefully slept with her. I mean, it was raped her in the house. So you can see the kidnapping and then also at the same time uh, sexual violence, rape. So the case was reported in 2014. I was new in Carnifin at that time. And we filed it, and then the medical report was subsequently given. We did all our treatment, and then the case was called. I went to high court to testify. I think that was 2017, and the case was decided in 2019, and the guy was convicted for 15 years. That was it. Was a very bad case. Uh, this is a girl who already had a mental problem. We know the uh, the effect of the sexual and domestic violence. They can also go into psychological trauma. So you insult upon injury. You rape this girl again, already has another medical condition. You're going to make the, the condition of this woman the worst, or this girl worse, rather. That was my experience. The other experience, shortly, I came here last time. Uh, 
this is a guy this is a girl of about six year old around uh, yuna uh, the village is there but i forgot the name this girl is a dara student in the morning according to the mom she usually take them to dara but that very day i don't know the little child girl uh, baby was sick so she decided not to go with her and i told the girl now you have been going with me you know the way so you can go on your own unfortunately this man met up with this uh, girl physically assaulted her huh? broke the two teeth and then they slept with her and they penetrated her when we saw that was shortly before i came here last time uh, examined the case it was uh, injury the hymen was broken completely you can even see the bleeding coming and also the posteriorly in the posterior vagina he has it was also lacerated so it was so bad uh, it's, it's, the police officer who in fact escorted this was crying bitterly because he could not stand it so you can see how not only the victims can have effect of the sexual violence but even we as medical doctors and nurses and the police officers we call that the vicarious trauma or the counter transference the the effect can transfer to us too because anytime you think about them it seems sometimes you want to put yourself in their position those are the effects that we can also have. and i've seen that in that police officer probably what she's thinking this could be her own child or somebody if this happened to her child so it was bad so not only have we seen the um physical um violence of, of rape, but also psychological um, trauma and the psychological effects um, of, of rape as well. Um, do you have any more examples um, of other forms of, um, uh, you know, cases that you have experienced at Carnifin General Hospital? Yes, uh, high profile cases that I, I experienced is still ongoing at the court. The case is not decided, but this happened also in 2014. It's a 14 girls, they live around Kesari and Kololi. Um, I was running a clinic, that was in, in, in August, or March, sorry. And then they were escorted by the, then the operation bulldozer, that these girls were usually sexually violated by one man at around Senegambia. And these kids are girls who usually sell around the beach area, the hotel, Hey, Aries, and then uh, this man will eventually invite them, cook for them, but with another intention, do pornography according to their story, also play with their genitalia, with their breasts, and sleep with some of them. And then to, uh, our findings so revealed some of them were sexually active because it was long, it, they have been going there for a long time. So it could be probably as a result of that, or it could be. They were between the age of 12 and then 17, 16, 14 of them. The case is still ongoing, I think, at High Court, because I went there to testify on two occasions, but the matter is still not decided. Okay. Thank you very much for providing those examples um, of um, rape cases that you have experienced. Um, but just in terms of the medical tests that you were explaining um, previously, um, you explain different types of tests, um, hepatitis test, um, AIDS test, um, as well as checking on the physical injury or not of the victim. Um, are there any DNA tests that are conducted here in the Gambia to determine um, perhaps who the perpetrator of a, of a rape is? Unfortunately, no. In fact, that affects our service. A DNA is a services in the Gambia unfortunately not available. And I always emphasize any gathering uh, of GBV or any workshop or any times I meet with uh, uh, lawmakers or the people in the authority, it's a concern. Because the essence is not only to, to help establish rape, to connect the perpetrator to the crime or the crime scene, but it also helps to vindicate the perpetrator. So it's good for both. So and I think most of our cases, when they report, you don't find evidence because there is late reporting. 
they report late, like more than 72 hours, you may not see the sperm's presence in the vagina sometimes, or you may not even see the injury because already 72 hours has elapsed. And then it's difficult to establish anything that will help the court to establish whether the rape has occurred or not. So, but DNA will help us a lot. And I think it's high time this country also have it, if we want to fight for sexual and domestic violence in this country and the rape. So how does the lack of uh, DNA um, facilities in the Gambia, how does it affect um, the prosecution of criminal cases in court for rape? As counsel, I think you may understand that rape, you have to corroborate it. It's not only a victim's narration of what happened, because usually it happened in a situation where nobody is present, usually. So it's the perpetrator and the victim. They all narrate their story differently. So to connect them, you need something. And what is that thing is the DNA to look for the evidence that is left by the perpetrator at the scene or that the perpetrator left on the victim. And that will connect them. And that will help. It's not only here, but outside world in America, in those days it do happen. People are sent to guilt because of rape, and they did not commit any crime. And about when the DNA was introduced, it, it exonerated so many people. So I think here also it will help us to do our job better, and also help the, both the victim and the perpetrator. Because if we are dealing with these people, you have to be neutral and not to be biased. You make sure that the justice is served. You exactly report what you saw so that at the end of the day, the justice is served and the justice is done on behalf of both. I know this is not your area, but do you know what the conviction rate is um, for rape in the Gambia? Do you know I whether it's it. low or is it high? Well, the conviction, you mean, the number of people who are convicted, I'm not sure. But I know that uh, penalties are attached, ranging from the tens to 25 years and even life imprisonment for those that um, uh, violated people sexually uh, who are under their care, like the parents or the guardians or even the teachers, is for life imprisonment according to Sexual Offense Act 2013. Thank you very much. Um, you've already mentioned the lack of DNA evidence uh, in the Gambia or facilities to test DNA evidence. Do you face any other challenges at the um, one-stop shop or, as you, or, as, um, or in your role as focal person at Canfin General Hospital? Um, just general medical um, problems that you may have. So we used to face problems like logistics uh, and supplies, but uh, recently we have some supply, but <laughs> that is whether it's sustainable is a question. Uh, reporting early to the hospital is a challenge for us. We know the culture of our society. The people tend to settle issues at the family level or the community level before they report. Sometimes it is only when the things go out of the hand, then they will proceed to the police, and from the police they will come here. Well, those are challenges. Those are the supplies, and then also the reporting to our facility. Uh, before, we have um, our office of the center, because it exists as one, so, but there was no office identified. It was a challenge, because our labor world, which was not very ideal, women are on in labor and at the same time you want to examine the victims of the sexual and domestic so it was not conducive at all sometimes you have to wait them allow them to wait till you have a space to examine them but now we have identified a space even though still that place also need to we need to improve on the facilities there but at least we have a facility now but basically the supplies and also the late reporting of the victims was our challenge, is our challenge, sorry. In terms of focusing on the um, one-stop centers, you've already explained the constraints that you face in terms of um, the medical aspect as well as the legal aspect. 
What about the um, psychosocial aspect of the one-stop center? Is, are there any challenges that you face there? Yes, there are challenges um, because the whole idea about the one-stop center is to have three services on the one unit. The ideal way would be to have them present or to have access to them whenever we need them. But that is not the case. Notwithstanding, on our part as the medical um, uh, practitioners, uh, nurses, and uh, we do our part. If there is a need to call them for any counseling, we will do. And if there is need for any uh, lawyers to intervene, also we will call. As of now, that's how it is. But they should all be on that. They should have their offices there, separate from, and then the, the social workers would have his offices there, and the medical team also have their offices there, where you have also the examination. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have that one all complete. But the idea of the one-stop center is, is in existence. And how are these sexual um, cases, uh, sexual violence cases, normally referred to the hospital? How do they get there? They usually come with police officers, which I always complain the way they suffer than the way how, how they reach at the hospital. I've interviewed so many police officers. They will say, well, we don't have transport. I have to stand on the way waiting for lift to come to the hospital. Sometimes they will tell me, my fear, that the victims and the parents of the victim don't have money. So I'm using my, could you imagine, the little salary that you get for your family, you're using also on the victim. The police station cannot have any logistics to carry this victim to the hospital. It's a real challenge. And then sometimes you see the back and forth, and it also delay the process. Because if there is no vehicle and you, the police officer, don't have money, so what do you do? It means you cannot go that very day. You have to come there. And the more time you delay, the evidence are lost. The more we lose our evidence as medical team. So um, the policy in place basically for referral of um, criminal cases to, to the hospital um, is not effective and it can cause, to, it can cause loss, um, loss in evidence. It's not effective at all. Okay. Do you have any, any other constraints that you know of that uh, police officers uh, face? Well, the other challenge would be the pressure on us. Uh, you are, it's not only the GBV case that you deal with. You also deal with other cases like women, uh, pregnant women in labor. You have to go to the theater. You'll be operating the victim will be waiting. Sometimes some will wait for six hours. It depends. Uh, because, yes, all cases are equal before us, but we give priority to cases. A woman in labor cannot wait. If a sexual violence comes and is, there is no life-threatening, she is not bleeding, obviously you will make, ask them to wait. Then you take care of that pregnant woman. So that is the situation we are faced with. So that will boil down to increasing the capacity uh, both the nurses and the doctors to be trained on the GBV so that the, the waiting time for the, the victims or the survivors can be minimized. What happens in instances where um, the victim reports first to the hospital? Would they normally be sent back to the police station or would you treat them? If we are done with our investigation um, treatment, we normally send them back to the police station. And if they need a medical remark, then they will come with the police officer, or the police officer will come alone, and we will write that medical remark and give it to the police officer. Um, and in your experience, um, what gender um, is mostly affected by um, sexual-based violence? Certainly women and the children, are the girls. Um, have you had any cases of uh, male violence, sexual violence reported to you? If my memory serves me, I think it's only four from 2014. There was one was a, a, a boy 
that was um, sexually penetrated by a man, that's one. The other one was a, a white man, uh, was have a Gambian wife, was uh, violated also at home, was physically. The other one was a man who married a, a second wife, and then the, I don't think the first wife was not pleased with that. And while having a sour, he just threw a chemical on the private part, was admitted also in our hospital. The fourth one I will never remember, but these are the cases that I remember that James Mill. But basically, the women and the girls are the most vulnerable. You mentioned the first case where um, a man penetrated a, a, a boy. Um, was that a case of sodomy? And was it rape? Well, it was, it, was, uh, it was not out of consent. And if it is not out of consent, even though it's, it's the same sex, well, it's a forceful penetration. And it's, uh, to me, I will call it as a sexual violence. And um, in your opinion, I mean, do you have any kind of, do you have a particular kind of woman that would come more to you? Um, on issues of sexual violence. Are there particular types of women, for example, that are more prone to sexual violence than others? The people who are young, the younger age, like from 5 to 12 years, are the most, the most common, even though we have people from within um, 13 to 25 years. But the the people, uh, the ch uh, children between the age of five and twelve, are the most vulnerable. From the statistics all over, uh, generally, because the reason being, they are weak, and they are easily threatened, and the, you can easily make them silent than somebody a grown-up one. So that may be the reasons. So that would be the age range that you would normally receive more frequently at your hospital. Certainly. What about in terms of um, social class or religion, um, race? I mean, do you think that you know there's any other, any particular woman that is more prone to sexual violence than any other one? The sexual and domestic violence, as far as Gambia is concerned, well, is not only directed to one specific ethnic group. It's across all aspects of our society. Uh, even though there may not be equal percentage between the tribes, but it happens in all the sectors of the society, regardless of the race or the cultural background or the educational background or their position in the community, it's, it can happen. I have seen security people being involved in the rape, both the police and the military, paramilitary. I have seen also the imams involved in the rape, I've seen ustas involved in the rape, teachers involved. I've seen medical personnel involved in the rape. So it crosses all sectors of the society. Um, I'll just take the opportunity to ask you a particular question here when you, you've mentioned that you've seen um, perpetrators of rape being from the security forces, um, for example. Um, we've had... Um, some testimony here at the TRRC um, from victims that may benefit from your medical expertise. So we'll just ask you some questions and um, see whether or not you, you're able to assist us um, with some scenarios. Um, for example, when one loses um, consciousness whilst in detention and then later finds themselves um, in hospital, having woken up and bleeding from their private parts, what um, would you say, in your medical opinion, would be the possible, possible causes of um, such an incident? Well, that will depend on circumstances, whether you are on confinement or whether you are in prison or you are restrained. Uh, unconscious patient bleeding from the vagina can be caused by many. It could be a normal menses. It could be as a result of trauma. It could be because the woman is pregnant and he sees um, by being violated or maybe out of stress or torture that become a miscarriage. Or it could be a medical condition, as I said, a fibroid, 
women can have this occasional bleeding. So it depends on the circumstances. But at it, again, the history before that woman or that person is confined will lead you to whether this was as a result of uh, the confinement or it was after the confinement or before the confinement. In fact, these conditions were there. So the history before that is very vital if you want to uh, establish whether that was as a result of the torture during confinement or during um, uh, uh, detention. Um, and we are talking specifically about, uh, you know, bleeding from the private part. And you mentioned, you know, it can be caused by torture. What kind of torture um, are you referring to? It can be physical torture. It can also be a sexual um, uh, penetration because for any sexual relation or intercourse to occur, psychologically women, they must be prepared you must be in the mood. And also, that makes them lubricated. That's why it's never painful, but instead enjoyable. And then if that is done on a coercive situation, on the coercive situation, usually you can cause injury, because at that time they will be very dry. Psychologically, they are not prepared. So those things can be possibility, especially when you are in detention. However, as I mentioned, there are conditions that can also um, warrant bleeding and they may be triggered by this com your confinement or they may come as because you had this condition before. And um, the situation of um, sexual torture which you describe would be a situation of rape, is that correct? Yes. And um, what other um, symptoms would you be looking for um, perhaps on the physical um, external features of the body to corroborate um, a finding of rape in that instance? Rape, usually it occurs under coercive circumstances. Coercive circumstances, you have to rule for external injury on the body, either a, a cut by a knife or sometimes even strangulation, scratches, bruises all over the body or the clothes that the person is wearing, whether they are torn, whether they are in order, so you do that head-to-toe examination physically and also the clothes that the woman is wearing to see any injury. So the injury also has their descriptions. Sometimes the way they defend themselves will tell you with a knife that this was a, a, a point of defending. Maybe the, So the history will tell you physical examinations from head-to-toe and also, of course, your vaginal examination will tell you. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was uh, very um, helpful. You've already explained um, the fact that even though sexual violence is more prevalent um, amongst women, but you have seen some rare cases of, of male violence. Um, have you received perhaps um, victims who are, let's say, HIV positive, AIDS patients who have also suffered um, forms of sexual violence before? I have never registered any. It's, sorry, it's only one. Uh, but that one, the 14 girls I, I told in 2014, among them one was positive. But when we traced, because the family also, when she was positive, we have to cancel the mother also to test. And we realized that the mother was positive. So probably it could, that could be the, we can trace the, where the infection come with from the mom, because the rest of the other girls, 13, were negative. Yes. But she was a, a victim of sexual violence, and she was um, an AIDS patient. Well, it, that was our finding, incidental finding. It could be. Okay, very well. Um, what about um, victims from the lesbian, gay, or bisexual, transgender, and intersex community, the LGBTIs as they are commonly known as. I mean, have you had any experience in the Gambia dealing with such victims? We had a training on that, uh, doctors, uh, but it's difficult to trace them because the fear, and usually they don't present themselves. It's the clinical experience. Sometimes you go deep to find out because 
we all know the stigma around uh, people of lesbian and the gays uh, in our society. Uh, virtually, there is no room for them. So to come up, come out and then openly and tell you as a health personnel is unless you use your clinical experience to 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 ask them pre present yourself as you are the one who want to help them their sexual life and then you will be able to know but it's it's happening in this country because the studies uh, the when we did the training that's the time i myself realized that oh I never knew that this is uh, happening in this country. So such victims um, would be underreported because of the stigma attached to um, their status? Yeah, the, obviously they'll be underreported. You have explained some of the um, health complications um, arising from um, sexual violence um, cases. Can you give us any more? I've made mention of the unwanted pregnancy when mm -hmm. rape occurs. I've also given an example of unsafe abortion. I've also given an example of um, uh, risky sexual behavior that a rape victim or the, a victim of sexual violence can adopt. Because uh, I think I have a victim who told me, well, t I've tried to maintain my virginity, but for the fact that I lost as a result of this, I could not longer hold it again. And I advised. Still, there is something that we can do. And I offered hymenorrhaphy. If provided, you want to hold yourself again. Well, can you tell us what that means again? Well, it's, to try and it's a procedure you do to put the hymen back to it. But it can never be original. But at least it will help the woman. What is the word? Can you please repeat Hymenorrhaphy. It? It's from the word hymen. All right, thank you. <laughs> please proceed. Yes, those are the immediate, as I said, physical injuries and then also pain. The long-term complication will be uh, pelvic pain. There can be also mental debility, psychological trauma, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. You can have also what we call uh, phobias and then also stress. You can also have... Uh, Generally, psychologically and then the medically, these are one of some of the things that can affect the perpetrator in the long term. And uh, the most important for female also, obviously they will get old and then they will get married and the infertility because we all know the sexual violence, for example, rape, is never the perpetrators uh, never protect themselves like use of condoms, so it will be. Um, uh, forceful penetration without protection and usually you can catch any kind of infection and that infections when they are chronic they are not treated usually they can lead to what we call PID pelvic inflammatory disease and this can later cause infertility in the sense that the, the tubes of the uterus that is the womb can get blocked because of the fibrosis and then that can affect the woman life again different from the, the rape and the psychological trauma that she, she underwent. Yes. And of course, you've already explained, um, you know, some of the other um, complications from um, sexual violence, such as fistula, and you know, some of the physical injuries. And you just mentioned some of the psychological um, aspects or effects of of, of that as well. Um, you've also mentioned some of the local challenges uh, dealing with um, cases of. Um, SGBV um, from a you know from a medical perspective can you give us more some um, some of the some more of the challenges that um, you face at the Carnifing General Hospital uh, the challenges may be that is more from the community level uh, the, the culture of silence that people t decided to bury the hatchet or put the everything under the carpet not to report because the, there you give the room perpetrators to continue doing, like the case I reported around Yuna, that the information I gathered was the man was fond of doing that, fond of doing that. And I asked, ah, since when? They could not tell me. Which means the society is aware, 
but nobody wants to report the case. And now the effect is continuing. So those kind of um, uh, culture of silence and the naive attitude generally also is contributing to what um, uh, promoting SVG, SGBV in this country. What do you mean by the naive attitude? Well, uh, generally, if I speak to women about this sexual domestic violence, some say it, it is not happening. If you see a woman being raped because the woman wants it, surprisingly. And then uh, there was a survey that was conducted here in 2010 and 2018 that was by Gibos, uh, Gambia Bureau of Statistics, supported by UNICEF, 2010. The, the 75 percent of women supported white battery in this country. It was a survey all over, and then 75 percent support FGM. 2018, the same thing was also conducted. It's only half, 49.9 percent supported white battery, but so you still you see that the FGM is still about 75 percent, which is still t the the women folk also. Uh, we need to create more awareness because uh, for us to fight SGBV in this country. And some of the uh, misconceptions which you um, have raised um, that are held by women themselves, um, would you say that um, those beliefs come from perhaps a patriarchal um, um, system or a male-dominated system? Well, as I said, uh, People may believe uh, the GBV is a product of genetics or maybe psychotic or crazy uh, because the perpetrators are crazy. But I think uh, these are uh, land attitudes and the norms and the inequalities within our societies. And those attitudes, I think they can be learned. They can be uh, on land. Thank you, Doctor. Um, you also mentioned some of the um, constraints you faced, um, you know, in cases, in court, for example, prosecution of um, rape cases. Um, you've already mentioned some of the social um, aspects um, or social constraints um, as well, and cultural and traditional. But from the medical um, perspective, what are some of the challenges um, in terms of um, just the medical side? What are some of the challenges that you face mainly in dealing with these cases? Medical challenges, as I said, will be, will be from the, the investigation. Investigations, the perpetrator in our, uh, the, the, the victims in our hospital usually is service free, if it is available. But sometimes it's not available. If it's not available, then it means it cannot be done. So that's a challenge. Why is a challenge? Because when you are dealing with the uh, victim of sexual violence, you want to protect that lady from future complications. And doing those examinations and tests will allow you to uh, treat that person. Like we give PEP at the hospital. PEP, you have to know the status before you give. Um, uh, usually, we give sometimes if at all is not available, like the PEP for the uh, HIV and for pregnancy. But it would be wise to have those investigations readily available at the hospital. And also DNA, as I mentioned, is, is one of the biggest challenges as far as our medical side is concerned with regards to this GBV. You've already provided some medical statistics also on um, sexual violence cases from Carnifing um, General Hospital. Um, and you've given us um, the kind of violations. You've also talked about the different age groups um, in which um, sexual violence is more um, prevalent. Do you have any means uh, of identifying, for example, who the perpetrator of uh, sexual violence is in any particular case? That's a challenge. Usually in our history, we will ask, who is the perpetrator? Is it a family member? Is it closer to you? Is it within the same community? But when the victim comes to the hospital, already the perpetrator is at large or is with the police. In fact, in our register, we have a column where the perpetrator's de uh, details will be taken. 
so that we also examine them too and then find out what kind of infection they have. But again, if you want to test somebody's status, you have to ask the consent. So you see the, our hands are tied sometimes. So I don't know what will happen. I think we need to look into our laws and see. With regards to the uh, uh, sexual violence, especially rape, I think the, is, the medical staff should be empowered in our laws to make sure that the perpetrators are tested because those sexual uh, uh, activity or is never protected. No condom was used. And then the woman can get infection through that, different from the, the trauma and the pain she went through. And um, from the information that you would normally get about um, the likely perpetrators, would you be able to identify whether you know, they're state agents or whether they're civilians, for example? Is that information you would normally get? Yes, we normally they will, ask, they will tell us, yes, it's a police officer, yes, it's a, or it's an ustaz, or sometimes it's an imam. Of course, we will do acts and they will tell us. But we will never set an eye on the perpetrator. We will usually they are at the police station. So, for example, um, what would be the proportion of state agents who have committed um, rape vis-a-vis -vis, um, civilians and perhaps also just, you know, looking at maybe particular people in society, like you just mentioned imams, like nobody would think that an imam would commit rape, for example. So what would be the proportions of these kind of people um, committing sexual offenses? The cases we receive are few, but... As I told you, there are under-reporting in this country, and this culture of silence uh, may also be a contributing factor for this under-reporting. Uh, if there is more sensitization and, and awareness, women empowerment, and, and I think we can have more, register more cases from the, from the respectful people in the society. But that is a challenge. The culture of silence and uh, the reporting is. And um, you've given us a lot of challenges, a lot of constraints, a lot of problems um, in the system um, dealing with uh, sexual of, um, violence cases. Do you have any recommendations on how to handle such cases uh, in the future from, from your medical perspective? Yeah, the recommendation I want to give, first of all, uh, uh, to run uh, an office that will be responsible for sexual and domestic violence in any country, funding is fundamental. Uh, if you look at Network Against Gender-Based Violence, it's private government thing, and then they supported by, then it was a Finnish foreign ministry and now is Action Aid the Gambia. I think the government need to take the ownership of this um, uh, program and then they fund it well, train people well, sensitize the populace, population to make sure we reduce or even if possible eradicate uh, sexual and domestic violence in this country. But without their commitment the political will and commitment and support, then it will be very difficult. It, uh, my experience is telling me that it's more of lip service than people. I think our actions should be more than our talking. And what is the level of uh, the training of medical personnel on um, sexual violence um, matters? Well, uh, not every medical doctor or nurse is opportune to uh, benefit from the trainer. Of course, a network is doing training every year uh, in Combo and in provinces, which I was a trainer. But uh, still, it's not enough. Because if you look at the health facilities in, the country, in this country, every major health center and then the district hospital should have a one-stop center. And for you to operate one-stop center in those facilities, you must train people. Because dealing with GBV cases is different from dealing with other ordinary patients. Their issues are many. Their right has been violated. 
they were physically violated. They are also in pain, and they are thinking about the long-term complications, and they are thinking about the future of their life, because uh, what next will happen. So dealing with them, you need to undergo training. And apart from the activities of the um, network, um, you know, especially on the one-stop centers, does government provide any kind of um, facility for victims of um, sexual violence in the Gambia? Well, usually we use SOS, but I don't think that is uh, government-owned. But governments would have a center for the victims, fully funded, they should have. And you're saying that they don't have? Well, no. So that responsibility has been shifted to the network against gender-based violence? Yeah, network work with um, SOS, yes. Any victim that needs a psychosocial counseling and need to be separated, sometimes they will send them there. And who do you think um, is responsible for victims of sexual violence in the Gambia? Is it um, a civil society organization or...? Is it government? The network partner with the civil society group Action Aid the Gambia to fight against sexual and domestic violence. So it's, we have stakeholders who are also part and parcel of this uh, uh, fight against sexual and domestic violence in the Gambia. Of course, the civil society were at, also at forefront. I think we're coming um, almost to the end of your testimony. Um, I don't know if you have any more recommendations before we conclude. Yes, uh, the recommendation I made mention of a few. DNA I have mentioned here. I have mentioned the center for the victim that will be government owned. I have also mentioned about the funding generally of the uh, these um, networks program and also the centers in all the health facilities. Uh, we also look, have to look into our legal side. Uh, I think you yeah, have already made mention of the cases that were uh, seen in 2014 for the cases to be decided in 2019. Well, I don't know. There might be reason for the delay, but I think the justice delayed is justice denied. And some of these victims, you realize that by the time you call them to court, they are already married and you want to bring them back to the courtroom with their uh, families to testify again. What are you doing again? Are you not traumatizing them more again? So I think the, the, the issues of the GBV at court shall be, should be dealt with, and, and they shouldn't allow it to drag on and then wait until we have, we even the people who took that history have forgotten about who is the perpetrator, who is the victim. So you have to go to the file and check what do I wrote, what, when was it, which date. So it's not helping at all. I think the, we need to look at our judicial system. Uh, the government, uh, Ministry of Justice, should look at it, work with, in partnership with network to see what they can do about it. I think they should be given priority when it comes to the court proceeding and they make sure that their, their cases are handled as soon as possible so that the justice is served. The other recommendations that I want to make, uh, I have also made draw light on that. That is to train the people who are involved in the domestic, sexual domestic. The, the health workers were trained, but about our, the police and the lawyers, although we have a few lawyers that we are involved in our, but this should be ongoing. It's not like it should happen once and all, because People will come and go. Tomorrow, I'm, today I'm there. Tomorrow, I may leave. Why I said this, in 2016, when I went to Tanzania for my program, virtually my center collapsed. Even though there are doctors in the hospital, there are nurses in the hospital, but people were not familiar with it. And for the fact that people don't like going to court to testify because of the cross-examination, which is always uh, difficult for people uh, so people don't tend to um, uh, associate themselves with issues of sexual and domestic violence. But I think uh, the training will help if they have 
the knowledge, I think that will empower them to deal with them and also to go to court and testify. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, that is the end of your testimony. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I, I hand over the witness to you for any questions you may have and um, back also to him for any final words. Um, just to let you know that the exhibit number is 91. Thank you. Thank you, the council. The request for that number is granted. And thank you thank very you. much, Emma, Dr. Defe, for your testimony. Before I give the floor to commissioners who may have some questions to ask, I have a small confession to make. Uh, sorry, I missed your uh, testimony the other day. I wasn't here. And uh, the first 10 minutes of your uh, testimony t this afternoon, I felt a bit uncomfortable and uh, uneasy uh, because uh, coming from a 30-hour flight from Beijing, China to uh, Banjul, it's as if um, the airplane landed here. I got out of the plane, came in here, and then started hearing about FGM in a very graphic way. <laughs> it was that part that uh, thinking that uh, this is a very conservative society and culture to hear that um, uh, graphic explanation, which I think is excellent um, uh, uh, in a society like this. Uh, I never thought I would hear it here, but that was what made me, having been born and raised here, a bit um, uh, uncomfortable hearing about the different types of um, uh, FGM. Uh, I uh, felt uncomfortable. I was looking for space under the desk and so I could just hide <laughs> and, and uh, uh, see what is. But counsel came to my help when uh, she contextualized it right away and said, um, uh, uh, FGM is a form of uh, sexual violence. Ah, c'est voilà. That's it. I'm rescued now. This is all okay. I won't go under the desk because I started looking at you. I say, who is this doctor? Where is he coming from? He's talking about these things in a conservative society and culture. But anyway, I've been helped, and uh, I think um, uh, the contribution is tremendous. Thank you again very much indeed. Commissioners, if you have any questions to ask, please also indicate. Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Duffy, um, I think you mentioned about a little girl of about six that was um, a, this FGM thing was performed on her and uh, there was a complication by the time they brought her to the hospital um, she passed away was it uh, the six year old or it's less than one year less than one year less than one year yes okay um, actually my question is what happened to um, the person or persons who performed uh, the, uh, the circumcision on them, on her? Yes, uh, unfortunately, as I told you uh, earlier on that we have a society, uh, this culture of um, uh, silence and also to negotiate things at the family level. Unfortunately, this girl was circumcised by the grandmother. The whole family came. And I insisted that the matter be reported to the police stations and then we'll open a file and that something should be done about it. People were on their knees. And then it happened to a point that the old woman is not even healthy from them. If we send to prison or you take that woman to police stations, you may cause another problem. And then it was a difficult situation. Uh, the family members who should even go forward with the case, I tell you that, well, if you should um, uh, if we proceed this case to the police stations, then it means the problem will come back to us. So you see the society. So at the end of the day, it's difficult, even for me. Uh, I, what, all what I did was to file it for as reference, and then the, and I told them the question that they, they should report the matter, and if the matter is reported, then I will write a report 
or certainly. And I told them that the woman should desist from it and then at their family level, and then the, they should not continue or allow her to be doing that kind of procedures that she could not take care of the complications. Because FGM, yes, you do, but the complication, can you take care of it? The bleeding? No. Then why? If you can take care of the complication, that is only one side. You may, but even that one, it is not proper. It's violating the right of a woman or a girl. So that's how it is, but we file it. Commissioner. Thank you. Deputy, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, you have helped us uh, in making recommendations. This is what we are required to do. Recommendations that include initiatives on human rights and peace building for children. Your testimony has given us a picture of a country where children between the ages of 5 to 12 are at risk. Your colleague before you from sexual gender-based violence. Your colleague before you, Hadi Boj Barrow, also gave a very uh, excellent testimony, just like yours, on the risks that children face in this country and ended up by asking, are we living in a country of pedophiles? As a country, we are committed. We should be. <laughs> what you have said shows that we are not committed to protecting children, to provide safety and security for them. So if children are not safe, they are not secure, they are not protected, will those <coughs> children be at peace? This child that you have just described, the six-year-old, who was violently violated. Her sexual reproductive health rights were violated. Physically, she was violated to the extent she lost her teeth. I'm sure she's suffering psychologically. The family must be going through very difficult times. From your ex explanation, it seems like it was an outsider who did it, but the people within the community knew that it was an outsider who did it. But at the same time, the gatekeepers who are supposed to protect the children, the teachers, the religious leaders, parents in the homes, are all violating the rights of these children. I have taken note of your recommendations. I've added one, of course, which is the resources for the, uh, how do you call it, for the security services to be able to take the victims to the hospital on time but I think we really, as a society, should take this business of sexual gender-based violence very seriously. Because every day, you see young girls and boys going to and from school in the morning, in the evening, and all these children are at risk. I just wanted to make that comment, Doctor, and to thank you very much for this excellent afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, my deputy. Is there are no further questions from uh, uh, Dr. Duffy, do you have any concluding remarks to make? If you do, please proceed to make them now. Yes, uh, I want to thank the commissioners, the council, the team for giving me this opportunity to be here today to speak to the whole nation and the world at large the magnitude of the sexual and domestic violence in this country is um, deeply honored and I also want to seize this opportunity to thank my team, the network office, the police whom I work with, and then my nurses, the doctors who are involved in the sexual and domestic violence uh, in this country. Uh, I have few remarks to make uh, in our society. I think we need to wake up in the sense we need to know what we want as a society. Uh, we, I believe that women and children are the most vulnerable when it comes to SGBV in the Gambia and the whole world at large. 
uh, we need to protect them. How do we protect them? If we protect these people, we protect the whole society. If they are not protected, then the society is not protected. I don't believe that any family head will sit at home when your family, your wives and your children are in danger. I don't think so. So we need to empower them and protect them. Again, we need to look at how to tackle this um, uh, SGBV from the grassroots. For me, I believe we have a problems at our schools. In the sense, the curriculum. I used to remember that there are curriculum that we are taught in schools. Family life education, it educates the young girls how to take care of their virginity, how to be careful to, when it comes to sexual activity. It also gives them a picture of uh, what and what to have in consequence if you do A, B, and C. So it is a curriculum that I think it should be reintroduced for uh, the, the, the younger generation, especially girls in schools, to educate them, to make them aware, because they are the most vulnerable. Again, there is another curriculum that is absent again, civic. It makes people an upright members in the society, make them responsible. It's also absent. It imposes on you, or it gives you that sense of nationalism. If there's, there is no sense of nationalism for any citizens, always there will be a problem. And that's what Gambia we have gone through. The sense of nationalism, as far as this country is concerned, is zero. We only think about ourselves. And that's not helping. It's high time that we love this country. It's high time that we speak the truth. And it's high time that we work together to make sure that we eradicate the sexual and domestic violence in this country. It's doable. It's not only a lip service, but our actions, as I said, speaks, speaks louder than our uh, voice. In that way, we will move forward. If not, then this issue of sexual and domestic violence will continue to perpetrate in our society. From the 2014 to 2019, if you look at my statistics, it's always on increase. It may be due to people are coming from forward because we are now a democratic society. Uh, people are now not afraid to come forward to report the cases. But yet still, if the trend is going like that, I'm afraid it's not helping us and doesn't tell well for our society. So we should come together and then help women and children of this country. Uh, if they are healthy, I think the society will be healthy. If they are empowered, the whole society is empowered. So it's our responsibility. I, I made mention that the GBV in this country affected all sectors of the society. I have seen lawyers' families were affected. Comes to one-stop center. They are legal practitioners because their family members are affected by this MSGB. So it's not like when you are uh, uh, the minister or you are the, the imam or you are the lawyer, that you cannot be affected. By the way, all our kids go to school. And then when they are at school or when they are coming home, sometimes we are not with them. We don't know what happened. They can be kidnapped on the way. Anything can happen to them. So I think we need to look into it. But these two curriculum, for me, I think it's true. Uh, if you look at this country, a small country, I think we should be more than where we are. Uh, uh, the saddest thing is Gambians, unfortunately, we don't learn lessons. I'm sorry to go backward, but if you look at it, uh, 1981, we never learned could it? We never learned lessons. 94, we never learned lessons. And uh, 2016, I thought we would learn lessons, but I don't think so. Because if you look at the attitude of the people generally, I don't see any sense of nationalism. And if that fails, then they will go into anarchy, go into chaos, which is not good for this country. This country got it independent together with Singapore, a landlocked country, if I'm right. 
why Singapore is at top and we are. We got independent. In fact, we got before them. We got in February. I think they got in May. If Singapore is will be termed as one of the most industrialized nation, why not Gambia? They are not intelligent than us. This country is blessed with a lot of resources. And I think we need to condone each other in the sense that to avoid violence. Let's support each other. If I am content, I am well off, and I have everything in my But my neighbors are poor. They will steal from me. They will harass my kids, and they will spoil my kids. That's the danger. So that's why we should carry each other and then they embrace each other so that we make a better society. That's what I have for this commission. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Daffy, for those very, very wise um, uh, words. Uh, the third triplet, um, Gambia, Singapore, uh, was uh, the Maldives on the 20. 1st of September 1965, all three were admitted as members of the United Nations. The other two <laughs> have left us behind. Singapore, as you said correctly, uh, is something that perhaps we need to think very much about why we have been left behind. But anyway, thank you so much for those very wise words, Sama, and thank you also for coming to testify and enlightening us on the very important issue of sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you again very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, before we conclude, there is some, uh, an issue that was brought to the attention of the commission uh, that is causing some concern on our part and uh, the Commission uh, would want me to make a, a statement on its behalf to highlight um, uh, this issue. I will read the statement out, and uh, it speaks for itself, and it will be issued as a press release. The statement I will read. The Commission is deeply concerned about the harassment and intimidation of some victims of sexual violence who testified about the violations and abuses of their human rights at the TRRC. It is most unfortunate and unacceptable that some survivors of sexual violence who have endured <coughs> such horrific experiences are being re-victimized by some members of the public as a result of their willingness to appear at the TRRC and they give a public account of what happened to them. No one chooses someone to be a victim of sexual violence. The testimonies of such victims should not be seen as an opportunity to score political or any other points. Their stories should not be dismissed. When victims of sexual violence use the TRRC proceedings to narrate their ordeal, they should be a space to promote healing, accountability, and the non-recurrence of such heinous crimes. It should never be a space to blame, stigmatize, or harass victims. As Gambians, we have a collective responsibility to and sexual and uh, gender-based uh, violence. These victims are our mothers, fathers, daughters, sisters, sons, and uh, brothers. The Commission will not allow survivors of sexual violence to be re-victimized through the TRRC process simply because they have been courageous enough to break their culture of silence in the Gambia and they speak out against these uh, such horrific violations. We should applaud and support them. 
if such harassment and intimidation of victims of sexual violence persist, the Commission may resort to frequent use of in-camera hearings, closed summer session summer hearings, as provided or <coughs> stipulated in Section 16.4b of the TRRC Act 2017 as a witness protection measure to safeguard the security and the well-being, to safeguard their security and well-being. Where necessary, the Commission will not hesitate to take appropriate measures against anyone who threatens or interferes with a witness in violation of Section 36 of the TRRC Act 2017, as that constitutes a criminal offence. <coughs> Therefore, the Commission urges members of the public to be empath empathic, empathetic sorry, and supportive of victims of sexual violence and desist from harassing and intimidating these courageous individuals. That's the end of the statement. We will resume our proceedings tomorrow, 10 o'clock in the morning. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Yeah.